What's up, y'all? Welcome back to another Fish the Moment live stream. Today I'm flying solo. Randy is fishing the Bassmaster Open on Neely Henry, and so wish him luck if you are on his social media or follow him on Facebook or Instagram. And so today, because I'm by myself, I thought that I'll take this time to break down the recent Bassmaster Lake Series tour event on Lake Chickamauga. There was a lot of crazy storylines going on, some crazy fish catches at the end of the day, and I thought that it'd be really great to show you guys where these guys were fishing to the best of my ability at least from what they showed on Bassmaster Live, talk about some of the techniques and some of the strategies that went into a very tough fishing event in the fall. So it should be a really good stream. For everyone listening back on the podcast app, welcome. And for everyone on the live stream here, welcome as well. We got uh, Yak Fish, GA Yak Fishing, Mike, Josh, Dan, Daryl, Timo, Ira, Mike, James, Marshall, Steve, Nick, a bunch of guys on here. Terry, how's everyone doing? There's Marshall. Good to see everyone on the stream. And, you know, today we're going to be talking about a lake that we actually broke down in a live stream a couple weeks ago. Basically, what, um, what we did is we looked at the best shallow and offshore spots on TVA fisheries. If you haven't looked at that live stream or watch that live stream, definitely check it out. I think it's live stream number 62. And Randy and I gave our best spots, shallow and offshore, on several TVA lakes, Tennessee Valley Authority lakes. One of those was Lake Chickamauga. And it was very interesting because Randy actually called the area that was used to win this tournament and also finish second. And that's on the upper end of the lake by the Hiawassee River area. We'll talk about that. And we'll also get into some of the challenging conditions down the lake and how one competitor actually was able to catch them offshore doing something very similar to what I had talked about in that live stream as well. We're also going to get into all the baits that they used. And I'm just going to try to dial you guys in on fall fishing a little bit more from a tournament perspective. Not just going out and fishing for fun, but how do you overcome tough fall conditions when you're fishing a tournament, especially in these highly pressured fisheries that have been getting a ton of pressure due to COVID and people being out in the lake and all that stuff. Should be a really good stream, and let's just jump straight into it. So let me get my all my screens pulled up here. There we go. So let's start out by just taking a high-level look at Lake Chickamauga. It is a fishery on the Tennessee River, and it's a very, very long fishery. It has some clear water down on the lower end where a lot of the offshore fishing is done. There's a pretty big mid-lake section that was somewhat of a player in this event, but not a huge player. And you can see that Chad Pipkins was down here. There were a few other guys in the top 10 that fished in this area as well. John Cox fished down this area. I didn't have recordings of all the different areas guys were in. And I'm, I'm not going to cover everything. I watched the last day of the stream at you know, kind of a high level and scrolled through it. I also watched a little bit of the other days of the footage. So I'm not like an expert on what was going on in this tournament. There's probably guys who watched all four days of footage who will know even more than I do, as well as guys that live on Lake Chickamauga that will know more than I do. But for those of you who didn't watch the tournament, hopefully this will be a good recap for you and I won't butcher it too much. But up here in the northern end of the lake, past this bridge here, that's where a lot of the damage was done by some of your top guys. We had Lee Livesey, who actually won the tournament, fishing up here. John Cox spent a little bit of time up here, but he was also fishing back down the lake as well. And then Mike Huff, who finished second in the tournament and caught like a six and a half, seven pounder the last day. He was fishing way up the river up here. And that's kind of the deal that transpired. It seemed like the better quality of fish and the better consistency, maybe not just better quality, but better consistency was up this river just a little bit. And there were guys definitely fishing all around the lake, but if you wanted to be in that top spot, you had to be fishing way up the lake. Now, just fishing up the lake wasn't enough to get the job done. And there was a lot of subtle adjustments to tackle presentation and approach these guys were using to beat the other competitors who were fishing very similar techniques. And Mike Huff and Lee Livesey, as well as John Cox, were able to kind of optimize, maximize the areas they were in with a different approach than what other guys were doing. And I'm going to get into that throughout the stream. So that was kind of just a high level of where guys were fishing. We're going to dive in specifically into what these guys are doing, areas and everything like that. But I also want to start by going through some of the baits these guys were using, just because that'll give us a pretty good idea of what was happening in general. So let me pull up the top baits from Bassmaster.com. 
This is a really great resource, guys. If you don't go on the Bassmaster.com often, they always have the top baits for every single tournament, as well as a short description of what these guys are doing, which is really, really helpful because it can give you guys at least an idea of what the guys were using in general. Not all these guys are going to give you the juice of all the baits they're throwing, but they'll at least give you a decent idea. I feel like a lot of these guys are holding back stuff for these articles and not showing you all the juice, but um, Bass of Live makes it a little bit hard to do that nowadays. But anyways, if we take a look, Kyle Walcher, who's been on a roll this last year, he also has a YouTube channel you can check out. He was fishing, uh, looks like a swim jig and or some sort of flipping jig and then a creature bait. And he was just kind of bouncing around from what I saw on live, fishing a bunch of laydowns, uh, fishing some mats as well with a frog, just kind of junk fishing. And that's kind of the theme you'll see with a lot of these baits that these guys are using. They're basically just picking up baits they can cover water with and fish a lot of different targets or junk fishing. And we'll explain what that is here in just a little bit as we get through the stream. Now, uh, for some of the air top finishers, we had uh, Ed here. He was fishing lots of flooded trees as well as fishing some grass and some mats. He was flipping uh, one and a quarter ounce weight, punching into some grass as well as just flipping and throwing a frog. So he was doing a lot of different things. Again, kind of that junk fishing mentality. That's the second guy throwing the frog, just keeping count. We got John Cox. He was also fishing a frog and a punch rig. So that's three guys in a row who are flipping and frogging to finish in the top 10. We have a little bit of a change here with Chad Pipkins, who was actually fishing offshore for this event, which is really interesting. And a lot of the guys on live were saying that they were struggling to get bit offshore just because guys were there, these fish were getting so much pressure from locals. And the guys who were able to catch them offshore had to really downsize their approach to get bit. Chad Pipkins was using a Ned rig and a small finesse swim bait. The other competitors we'll see in a bit kind of did the same deal. And that was really a key. Unless you were getting into a really good area where you could catch them on a the frog and power fishing, and you were trying to fish more of the community holes, more of the uh, standard traditional Chickamauga spots, you had to downsize to a Ned rig, to a small swim bait, to finesse baits, to get fish to bite, as opposed to going with your standard football jigs, deep diving crankbaits, things like that. One competitor was able to actually use some of those baits, which we'll talk about, and that's Stetson Blaylock. Stetson Blaylock was able to get that offshore bite to play for at least about a third of his fish throughout the tournament, maybe about half of his fish, and he showed here that he was catching some fish on a frog and a little... Um, scrounger head, but he was also doing some damage on a bigger scrounger head and a deep diving crankbait. He had several baits that he was fishing throughout the tournament. He kind of had a one-two punch of some schooling fish and some offshore fish. Kind of a unique deal. We'll talk about that a little bit. He didn't really get into it in the article or on live, so a little bit hard to dial in, but we'll talk about it some. Austin Felix kind of had that same approach. He fished a lot of the major popular creeks and some major offshore areas and he was focusing again on like a Neko rig he was throwing a regular Jacinko around as well as throwing a Ned rig so these really subtle approaches these subtle baits were definitely playing for these top competitors and the guys who were just throwing their regular spinner baits crankbaits jigs were not getting it done again due to fishing pressure also caught some fish as well on a frog a lot of guys were throwing a frog in their arsenal getting a few bites. I know on the last day Austin Felix caught a big fish on a frog and was catching some in the afternoon, but he was having to mix in the finesse plus the frog to get the job done. Uh, Todd Otten was actually interesting. He was fishing a lot of the major creeks and some more of the popular areas throughout the lake, and he was just sticking a half ounce chatterbait in his hand. And I want to make the call out that he's throwing the original chatterbait. He's not throwing the jackhammer chatterbait, and that's actually interesting because I like to throw the original chatterbait as well. I don't know why everyone loves the jackhammer so much. It's pretty much the same thing as the original chatterbait. The jackhammer does have the hand-tied skirt, and it does have the better bait keeper. But I modify mine a little bit just to keep the bait up and stuff like that. But the original chatterbait still gets it done, and it's a really, really good uh, bait. And he was also using a discontinued bladed jig. Not sure exactly what that one was, but um, definitely get the job done with this, the original chatterbait. Uh, Jake Whitaker, he was actually fishing two dock slips the entire tournament, which is really crazy. He literally just casted at the same two dock slips pretty much all day for four days straight. And he caught all of his fish on a little tiny Kitek 2.8 inch swim bait, as well as a 
kind of interesting um, swim bait with a blade in the tail. I've talked about this actually in a previous video. I've actually shown this rig, and it's a rig that we use here in the Ozarks a little bit, or at least some guys do. I don't use it that much, but he was using these combo of the little Kitek and this little bladed swim bait rig that was made by Sabeel and Patrick Sabeel from Sabeel Swim Baits, and kind of an interesting little bait throwing a little eighth ounce jig head and he was just slowly skipping it and or skipping it and then slowly reeling it through these docks so we'll talk about that mike huff he was almost able to come back and take a come from behind victory and he was catching his fish on a combination of a frog he had a last minute frog catch on the last day as well as fishing some jigs and also doing some flipping he caught a lot of fish on that cumberland pro casting jig or the caster jig and then caught a lot of good fish on the frog as well on the final day. That was kind of his one-two punch, the jig and the frog. And I really like what Mike was doing. We'll talk about that a little bit. He was kind of getting away from the crowd, going really far up the creeks, kind of like what Randy would be doing, and sticking with a jig, which he knew was a high uh, or is a good quality fish bait, and then mixing in the frogs like everyone else to get the job done. And then finally, Lee Livesey fishing, um, fishing a little bit. Looks like there he's throwing a spro bronze eye. Uh, regular frog with a, uh, in the red ear color. That's my favorite frog like, ever. He showed here that he's throwing this scum frog launch frog. Not sure if that's the exact bait he was actually throwing, um, but that is definitely a Spro uh, Bronze Eye, regular like Bronze Eye 65 in the red ear color. So not exactly sure what the exact bait he was throwing, but one thing that he did talk about is that he was adding two eighth ounce weights inserted into the body cavity for extra noise. And he says he was doing that for noise, but I'm telling you guys, this is a, I don't know if it's really a secret. Guys have been doing it. I've, I've known about this since I was like 12 years old. But basically what they do is they take a frog like this and the guys that used to do it, they used to put BBs in the frog. You put little BBs in the frog and you would put maybe 15 of them in there. And the reason you put those BBs in is because the frog, when it's just standard, it has a little bit of weight in the bottom. And that weights it and keels it so it can walk side to side. Well, all of the guys like Lee, if you look at his winning area here, I kind of have it pulled up. Um, let me show you exactly what he's doing. He was fishing all this flooded grass, this matty grass. I mean, there was just grass everywhere. If you look at all this grass around him, it's really thick stuff. It's not like a canopy or anything. He's fishing so, so shallow that there's not like a canopy under that grass. It literally looks like he's sitting on like someone's front yard. And as a result, when those mats are so thick, by adding those extra eighth ounce weights, it actually pushes the mat down and displaces the water more when you're dragging that frog across the mat. And it's not as much for the sound. It's actually just to weight that frog down to create like almost like a, a wake if it's like you put a bigger weight on top of there, it's going to push more water against that mat, move that mat more, and call those fish to it. It's definitely a little secret deal um, for some guys. I don't know if it's a secret. If I if it is a secret, I just spoiled it. I've known about it for a really long time. But basically, you just put those, you know, right there, he's putting almost a quarter ounce of weight into that frog to weight that thing down, push it down against those mats, and that will definitely get you some more bites. If you haven't been doing that, Definitely check that out. It's also interesting because all these guys that are fishing these frogs, they're cutting the legs on these frogs really short. And I do that with my frogs as well. The shorter you cut those legs for me, one, the better the walking action is. And two, the better I feel like those fish actually get the frog. So trimming those tails on that frog is pretty important down really, really short. So, you know, don't cut them all the way off, but cut them so that there's only maybe like two inches of the tail versus four inches. That's the deal right there. So that's some deals that um, that the guys are throwing in terms of baits. Now let's jump over and kind of go through what some of the top guys are doing from a Navionics and a Google Earth perspective. Starting out with Navionics, again, a lot of the guys were fishing way up the river up here, past this bridge. I don't even know what highway bridge it is. I'm really bad at remembering to look up what these highways are, but whatever this road is here, up up, up here, we have a couple different rivers, arms, river chains. There's the Hiawassee, which I think is this river, or maybe it's this river, um, but there's the rivers that cut, cut up up here, and this is where Randy, when we did our, um, our live stream about where to fish on the Tennessee River, this is where he said he would be fishing in the fall. 
way up the rivers up this creek arm as well as up this main creek here. This is a great place, Randy was talking about, to find some shallow fish on the main river channel, fishing trees and fishing some grass and all kinds of stuff, just kind of jump fishing. Well, that was kind of the technique for a lot of the guys, but interestingly, the eventual winner, Lee Livesey, he spent most of his day fishing in this small little area right in here. Now, I don't know exactly where he was in all these situations. I think he spent some time in here, spent some time around these fish. I think he caught some fish here the first morning and then also around in the, this area. Not exactly sure where exactly he was in here. But one thing you'll notice is that the water was dropping throughout this tournament. It was falling down. And when Randy was talking about fishing these areas, he said that finding these areas where or fishing up these rivers is best when that water is falling, when it's dropping. And what was happening is that a lot of these mats that these fish are getting under, like up in this area and here, in this area up in here, they were in like 10 inches to maybe a foot of water. And it was almost impossible to get your boat up into these areas. If we look where Lee is, he's literally pushed in as far as he can in these areas. He was even using a push pull at times to push himself up into the grass. What he was basically trying to do is put his boat in as shallow water as possible. And sometimes he was fishing a little bit further out, just around some of these islands. This, these shots are from fishing around this island, I believe, right here. But he was trying to push his boat, and I'll kind of get into the end of the day clips when he was really pushed up in the, the mats. Bassmaster loves this website design because they get like a million page clicks. I've already clicked like 42 pages, 43 pages now. So this is great for their analytics, but these are very annoying. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have ever dealt with this. So annoying. Anyways, let's keep going. Just give me one second. I'm, if you're listening on the podcast, I'm literally just like clicking through a million Bassmaster pages. But here is the area he was in, and he's doing a big fist pump, catching fish out of the grass. Um, there we go. So you can see the area he's in. Like he is pushed up way in this big grassy flat, and... The idea is that he has his trolling motor up and he was push pulling with just a regular pull, pushing himself back into these giant grassy flats. And there were little ditches that would run back in here and a little bit deeper water, but these fish were setting up on mats that were in maybe a foot to maybe 18 inches of water at most. You can't float a 21 foot fiberglass boat a lot of times in that water depth. As a result, what he would do is he would get back in these areas and I'll kind of go back in here where he was, you can see this flat. Like he was fishing super, super shallow water in here, super skinny water. I think he may have been somewhere in here. He may have even been like back over here. I'm not exactly sure where he was again, guys. He was in these general vicinities, somewhere in this flat, somewhere on this flat, and then somewhere around this island. And it doesn't make that big of a difference exactly where he was. The whole premise applies that there were some areas in this giant grass flat where groups of fish were setting up. And you would have maybe an area that was like this big right here that had a bunch of fish on it, just one little stretch of a mat. And then there was an area maybe over here that had one stretch of a mat. And that, those were two spots that all the fish were congregated. This is, oh, I'm not even showing you guys Google Earth. Here we go. Sorry about that. Um, here we go. So this is the area he was in. He was kind of up in this super shallow, shallow water area. And he was maybe over here, over here. I keep doing that, guys, when I'm flying solo. I just get uh, get too excited to talk about fishing. But anyways, um, this is the area he was in. And there was grass all through here. And these fish can get in these small little areas, like the size of the front deck of your boat. And they'll just be grouped up in those areas, especially in the fall. And you have to fish a ton of water and cover a lot of these flats to find these fish. And that's kind of a testament to Lee. In practice, he probably had to commit really strong to these areas and just know, hey, these areas have some fish. I need to cover all this ground to find those few little sections, those few little sweet spots where the fish um, are positioning. And Lee was basically just putting his boat up here and he would push pull in there. And he was making casts that were anywhere from, they were saying 75 yard casts. I don't know if that's possible. Um, I, I 75 yards seems like an exaggeration. It's kind of like wave height. Like, man, I was in six footers when really there were three footers. I could see him making maybe a 50 yard cast, but uh, 50 yard cast, really far cast out to the 
um, these spots where he saw the fish, and he was literally just bombing that thing. And that helped having braided line on his frog and also weighting that frog with those weights. He cast it farther as well, which is another deal he didn't really mention, I don't think. But the fact that you could cast those that frog further helped get that bait out there. And then he basically has trolling motor up. So he wasn't using his trolling motor at all. He didn't want to spook these fish. And he was push-pulling in because these fish are highly pressured in Lake Chickamauga. These fish probably have seen every single frog in the, in the entire uh, tri-state area thrown at them in the last two months. There's big frog fishing tournaments on Chickamauga, all this stuff. And because of that, all of the easy frog fish that might have been out here near the flats on the main channel or like easily accessible in these cuts and stuff, those frog fish were tough to catch because they were so conditioned, super, super conditioned to frogs going over their head all day. So by one, sneaking up on, or one, going in these areas that were super shallow, they're like in a foot to 18 inches of water, these fish are getting a lot less pressure than the other fish that might be in there. Plus, on top of fishing areas that are less pressured, these fish probably still get some pressure. He also was making really long casts with that weighted frog, and he was push-pulling in instead of using a trolling motor. All of those small, subtle details allowed him to maximize these areas and catch his fish. And this is one thing that's super important to think about, guys, is that when you're going out to the lake, you might just think, oh man, why am I not getting bit? I go fish the grass mats like everyone says, I'm throwing a frog like everyone says, and I'm just not catching fish. Or why can't I catch fish like the guys in the Bassmaster Elite series? Well, if we go back over to the screen over here, let me transition this back over here. I just want to like make a case in point for you about how difficult the fishing was on this lake because it's not like the fishing was lights out and you're going to be able to go and catch fish. I'm just rolling through it. I, I'm, I'm going through the results. Let me just uh, pull this up. Here we go. So if we look, Lee Livesey, he had a four-day total of 58 pounds. That's pretty good. Looking like he's catching some good fish, um, averaging like 15 pounds a day almost, and he was really rolling. But then let's say we go down to 40th place. These are some of the best bass fishermen in the world. On a two-day total for 40th place, you had to have... Actually, it's a three-day total for 40th place because um, this these guys made the cut. It's 18 pounds. A lot of these guys are catching 22 pounds for three days of fishing. That's like seven to eight pounds a day. Not great. Barely catching two-pounders. And then if you go to the bottom half of the field, they only fished one day, you got some of the best fishermen out there catching in two days... 13 pounds, 10 pounds, 11 pounds, like so many of these guys who were, you know, veterans. Clark Wendell, he was leading angler of the year going to this tournament. He had an 81st place finish. One of the top guys in the tour, best year, having the best year, he got one three pounder in two days of fishing. So this isn't going here to smack, like to bash Clark Wendell. Seth Fighter, awesome fisherman. Rick Klon, awesome fisherman. Uh, let's see here. Corey Johnston, these guys who are. You know, David Fritz, years of experience. They're going out there and catching a few, very, very few fish. And the guys up at the top are crushing them. You're like, man, how are they really doing that? Well, it's not because they're going out and fishing these obvious areas and just rolling around and finding a bait and just getting lucky to roll in an area. When guys are getting into these areas and catching 15 pounds a day, they are doing something very unique and very different. Whether that is rolling up into a foot of water flat, push pulling in and then making 50 yard casts with a customized frog. Or for example, guys down the lake like a Setson Blaylock fishing a very, very isolated sweet spot. I don't know exactly where he was fishing, but he was fishing somewhere in this zone, fishing offshore. And he found one sweet spot offshore and then he found a little creek way back in the back of a creek or a pocket. I don't know again which creek or pocket he was in, but one of these pockets may have been like this one or this one in here. And these fish were schooling and he was finding some schooling fish and getting on like a certain bait. Or like the guy, one of the guys, Jake Whitaker, who was in one of these marinas over here and he was literally just fishing the exact same boat slip for four days straight. And he's fishing one boat slip with a very unique subtle bait for four days. In the fall, a lot of times, that's what it takes to get these fish in the boat. It's a very subtle, minor change, minor approach to be consistent and to catch them. Now, you don't have to do the Lee Livesey approach of going and doing these very off-the-wall, oddball techniques. 
There are guys, for example, like a John Cox, who found multiple different areas spread across the lake, and he was fishing way up here, up the river. He would then run to the mid-lake section of the lake, and then he'd run all the way down, down towards the dam. And he was just barning around, fishing a frog and flipping, and kind of basically junk fishing, just fishing what's in front of him, reading the water and catching fish. And he didn't do as well, obviously, as the winner, but he was able to roll around and catch some fish by experimenting with different areas, moving around the lake, and using his intimate knowledge of this fishery to get bit. Now, John Cox has won like three tournaments on Lake Chickamauga, so he's maybe not the best example. But another great example is Mike Huff, who was fishing way up this river. And he basically got way away from the competition, and he was doing a lot of junk fishing. If you watched him on the final day alive, he was fishing, he caught a really big fish off a bluff wall around here, and it was just a steep, rocky bluff wall. He was then catching some fish on some isolated laydowns up and down this river, fishing laydowns, and he was also fishing, I think, more towards like this area, somewhere in here, and he was fishing some matted grass and some floating vegetation. So basically, he was mixing up the frog, he was flipping, he was flipping grass, he was fishing laydowns, he was fishing bluff walls, and this is what people call junk fishing. It's basically taking four or five different baits and fishing four or five different types of structure and finding an area of the lake where you can run five to eight miles of the lake and just fish a little bit of everything. The same thing that Kyle, Kyle Welcher was doing here and the, the previous tournament on Lake Gunnersville up the river. These guys are just basically taking baits that... They know are good quality fish baits, a frog, a jig, flipping, chatterbait, stuff like that. And they're running a little bit of everything that looks good, hoping to get five bites in a day. Now, Mike Huff didn't even get five bites, I don't think, every day. I think he only ended up, let me look here really quick. I think he only ended up with, um, with 19 fish. I don't know. Let me take a look at the results here. I'm just pulling this up. I think he only had 19 fish out of 20, so he didn't even weigh in a limit every single day, despite finishing second in the tournament. And that's like the, no, he had 18 fish. Mike Huff finished second and had 18 fish. If he had put in one more two pounder, either of those days that he didn't have a limit, the first day he actually weighed three fish for six pounds. For that first day, he would have been able to put two more keepers in the boat. And let me show you this real quick. This is crazy. Um, this is the kind of stuff that, you know, makes or breaks you is, he only had three fish the first day and then was able to string together a 19-pound day and an 18-pound day back-to-back, -back, just absolutely crushing them. And that was awesome. He was able to kind of dial it in near the end. But it's just as likely that he wouldn't get those bites in the last two days. And it's hard to string together four really good days, four consistent days, unless you're on a really, really solid deal. Even set in some blade lock at 16, 12, 13, then two pound, one two-pounder the last day. It's pretty interesting how that happens where it's like the it didn't it didn't seem like anyone was able to string together five, four really really good consistent days. And these are guys who are practicing looks up obviously Lee Livesey. Uh, he was the only exception, but all of the best anglers in the world who have 3 days of practice, almost all of them were not able to string together four good days in a row in the fall on the Tennessee River. I mean Lake Chickamauga is an awesome fishery. So what that means is that if these guys are struggling on a fishery like this, imagine on your home fishery that maybe doesn't have the population of fish Chickamauga does, doesn't, you know, have three days of practice, you're just going out there for one day of fishing. It can be very, very tough to even find and go catch a fish this time of year. And in general in fishing, you know, it's not like the fish are always biting. So don't beat yourself up too much if you go out and you have a bad day or you have two or three bad days in a row. It happens to everybody. There's pros, again, who finished in the last place in this tournament and they practice for three days they fish these lakes for their entire life and they fish for a living and they weren't able to put more than one or two keepers in the boat or more than 10 pounds in two days so don't beat yourself up too much that's just the way fishing goes now a couple deals i want to talk about that were really really sneaky is how lee livesey dialed in the forage he was focusing on versus the other competitors before we do that i want to jump over and talk about a few things that we're changing up on fishthemoment.com. So just give me half a second here to pull all this up and transition over here. So uh, if you guys haven't been over to the website, check out uh, our website, fishthemoment.com. We offer a lot of different great 
bass fishing resources, educational resources, and definitely can help improve your bass fishing for sure if you check them out. I've been spending about the last three or four days, maybe five days, revamping some stuff on the website, redoing some products. So I want to talk to you guys about that because there's a lot of stuff that's changing, and that's probably why you haven't seen so many um, so many videos coming out and things like that. So first thing I want to call is that we are now offering Randy virtual lessons. So Randy Blockett, my partner, he is going to be giving one-on-one virtual lessons alongside of myself. I've been offering virtual lessons for like a year and a half, and now Randy is going to be offering them as well. He is you know, an expert, obviously, on tournament fishing, so he would be great to do tournament prep videos with, to look over your lake, get prep for a tournament. He'll get on a Google Hangout with you and show you spots on Navionics, Google Earth, all kinds of stuff, talk you through the mental side of the game and a lot of the tournament aspects. At the same time, he also has a lot of shallow water expertise, so if you want to get dialed in on your shallow water game, definitely the guy to talk to, as well as bass behavior. And if you are interested in booking a fishing with fishing lesson with me, I focus a lot more on offshore bass fishing as well as electronics, but I can also talk about bass behavior, seasonal bass movement. Rain and I are both very well versed in that aspect, so definitely something that we recommend you guys signing up for if you want to learn more about fishing and about certain techniques. And all you have to do is just go to the sign up here button on the website and you'll be able to sign up for either Randy's lessons or my lessons. I would definitely sign up for Randy's lessons as soon as you can because they fill up so fast. I'm offering Randy's lessons or we're offering them during the day and then mine are at night. And that way you guys have multiple options. I'm already booked up like a month and a half in advance always just perpetually. So definitely sign up for these Randy lessons if you're interested. Definitely worth your while. And for the first like two or three weeks here, like these weeks here, I'll also be on the call with Randy. So you'll kind of get a double dipping because I'm going to help him with all the tech stuff. So you're actually going to get me and Randy both if you sign up for these lessons the first few weeks. So good little bonus there for the first responders. We're also going to be continuing to do our virtual seminars, and we actually have an offshore bass fishing seminar this Thursday, which is now full, so thank you guys for signing up for that. Also have another advanced jerkbait fishing seminar that Randy will be giving, and this one's going to be focused on bait modifications, styles, and colors. He's going to go through all the tricks of the trade of how he uses Brillo pads to... uh, do certain things with jerk baits, how he uses suspend strips, um, puts different colors on the jerk baits, switches out hooks, adds extra split rings, how he retrieves his baits, the line, the rods, all these little nuances of jerk bait fishing, as well as all the secret colors. If you've signed up for the last advanced jerk bait class, then you will have seen a lot of the baits or a lot of the areas and the conditions for jerk bait fishing, but we didn't get into all the bait selection and all the little modifications that Randy has perfected over the years. And Randy actually is one of the guys who designed, he was like one of the lead designers on the Mega Bass Vision 110 jerkbait, the most popular jerkbait on the market. So he knows his stuff about jerkbait fishing for sure. So definitely sign up for that class. There are about 20 spots left. So definitely get on that before it fills up. We're also going to have Mega Bass actually promote this. And so by then it's going to fill up immediately. So definitely sign up if you guys want to get in on this. And also we're doing an electronic seminar. I always give one of these about every other month. And so this is an advanced bass fishing electronics class focused on learning how to read your electronics, understanding if fish are catchable on your electronics, how they're positioned on the graph, all this stuff to really optimize and maximize your offshore fishing game. And it's not just basic like 101, it's really advanced content. So if you don't know how to read a fish finder, check out the YouTube channel, Fish Moment YouTube channel. A lot of videos there on the basics. This is advanced stuff for guys who really want to dive in and learn how to maximize their electronics. So that's that. Um, We're also going to be selling some of the recordings of these seminars as well coming up. I just need to add that to the website. That's one of the things I haven't done yet. And like Randy's jerkbait seminar he's given before, some of the seasonal bass movement stuff, we're going to be selling the recordings of those seminars as well on the website in the coming weeks. And then I know I'm talking a lot about all this stuff, but uh, one more thing I wanted to talk about is that we are going to be revamping and re-improving the Fish the Moment Lake Breakdowns. We've been getting a ton of emails from you guys asking, where are the lake breakdowns? I can't find the maps. Don't worry, we're still doing them, but we wanted to kind of overhaul them because we've been doing them with the Navionics maps and Google Earth and stuff for a while, and we felt like 
we could give you guys a lot better, more detailed information if we actually provided GPS coordinates for you guys. And so what we're gonna be doing is giving you guys 20 GPS coordinates, 20 waypoints of offshore areas, and 20 waypoints of shallow water areas with exact pins on like, here are the, the rock transition banks you need to be hitting. Here are the isolated laydowns you need to be fishing. Here's the offshore ledge, the offshore hump. And it will actually be, you'll be able to transfer these waypoints directly to your fish finder and then look at those spots on your graph as you drive around the lake. It's gonna be really cool. I'll have instructions on how to transfer the waypoints and everything. And we're launching those again on Friday. And so we've been spending like, I'm gonna spend all week pretty much just redoing these maps to make them a lot more detail, a lot more effective for you guys. And hopefully really help you dial in your offshore fishing and your shallow water fishing to an even greater extent. So that is all we have for the website stuff. So now let's get back to the juice on the Bassmaster Elite Series event. Okay, let's transition back over here. Cool, let me take a drink after all that. I need to take a break. There we go. Anyways, so one of the big things that I wanted to touch on that Lee talked about, which is really, really important, especially for fall fishing, is that the majority of the field was struggling to get bit, especially on the lower end of the lake, because the bait fish on the lower end of the lake were tiny for in like the majority of the spots. You had a lot of bait fish that were, you know, maybe an inch, inch and a half long, and they were all over Chickamauga, just everywhere. And whenever you have those bait fish that are an inch to inch and a half long, it's really hard to convince bass to eat a bigger bait, a two or three or four inch bait even, because they're keyed in on such small baits. And if we go back over to look at the top baits from these this event, so let me switch back over here real quick. If you look at these top baits, you can see that while Lee Livesey was focusing on like a frog and some guys were flipping and stuff like that, the guys who were fishing with um, shad imitating baits had to go to these tiny little baits, these small little swim baits with eighth ounce heads like Jay Whitaker did. And the reason they were going to such a small bait is because they had to imitate those tiny bait fish to get these fish to bite. You can see just these are tiny baits. And the smaller the bait fish are, again, the harder it is to get those fish to commit to your bait. And Stetson Blaylock was able to do it for a few days of the tournament, but struggled on the last day to really get these fish keyed down those small bait fish to fire. Now, on the other hand, you might see, well, look at, you know, my cuff. He's throwing a frog, a jig, this big flipping bait. Well, why are they throwing these big baits when the fish are keying on shad? Well, the fish they were feeding that were they were targeting weren't actually focused on shad. They were feeding on bluegill. And that's something that's super important to think about when you're fishing in the fall. A lot of times, the forage in your area is going to dictate how you need to approach your fishing. Especially when there's a lot of bait fish. There's a lot of small little tiny bait fish. And in my experience, what I always find in the fall is that if I'm running into a lot of tiny small bait fish, I actually try to leave those areas and I try to focus on fish that are feeding on one of two other forage types brim or bluegill or crawfish and in my area of the country the ozarks there's a lot of fish to feed on crawfish because it's such a rocky type lake but on chickamauga the crawfish population maybe isn't as big there's not nearly as much rock as there is on like a grand lake or a table rock lake and so because there was so much bait fish around what these guys were doing like lee livesey and john cox is they were going up to these areas where not only were there not as many small shad, but there were a lot more brim, a lot more bluegill. But one other thing that was really special about Lee's areas is he didn't just have the bluegill in his areas, he also had big gizzard shad. Bigger gizzard shad were pushed up in this area. And so that bait fish held more, or those, those bigger bait fish made those fish a little bit easier to catch with your traditional bigger baits, your jigs, your frogs, stuff like that. And by getting away from those tiny thread fin shad and focusing on areas that had the brim, the bigger bluegill, and also had the bigger gizzard shad was the key to catching these fish. And a lot of times what I focus on in the fall when I go to a lake and try to break it down offshore specifically is I am looking for areas where I can find schools of shad that are at least, the shad have to be at least like two and a half to three inches long. If you have a three inch long shad that tells me that these fish are going to be actually 
more aggressive and they'll actually eat your bait. And if they are all feeding on these tiny, tiny shad, these one inch shad, I just vacate the area. Like if I roll into, you know, let's say, let me pull up Navionics here really quick. Let's say that um, I'm over here on Chickamauga and I'm down near the lower end. And I find that I'm fishing in the mouth of this creek and there's a really nice channel drop right here. A nice little, or a nice little point with a drop off of it and there's no hump, another hump here. But the bait fish in this area are all absolutely minuscule and tiny. I'm not going to even bother fishing this area. I'm just moving on. And what I'm going to try to do is locate those better than average size shad. They don't need to be the five and six and seven inch gizzard shad, though that's helpful. Instead, I just try to find the areas with the little bit bigger shad, those three or four inch shad, and that's going to make those fish more catchable. It's not going to, not like the areas with all the little tiny shad don't have fish. They do. But the ability to actually get those fish to react to your lures is a lot lower when those shad are smaller. Now, basically what you'll have to do is go to areas then that are going to have a bigger forage for those fish, the bigger crawfish or the bigger brim. Now on Chickamauga, the areas that a lot of these guys were focused on, just kind of give you a few more options. Down in here, John Cox was fishing in these islands in here, and they're in these super shallow flat areas. There were some brim that were probably up there from the, the spawn earlier that year, just like the brim, brim beds and stuff all through these areas. And you can actually even see, I don't know if these are, these aren't, those aren't brim beds, but you can see there's a bunch, there's some brim beds right here. There's a bunch of just stuff in here those brim can get up and feed on. And he was just throwing his frog around in these giant flats, focusing on those bass that were feeding on the brim. Now, there probably were 10 times more bass out here offshore chasing those little tiny shad as there were fish up here in the grass. Again, the deal is, though, is that the fish in the grass, even though there were maybe one, uh, one for every 10 offshore, that one bass is a lot more catchable because it's feeding on a bigger forage, a bigger bluegill, and therefore, that's why these guys were fishing for them, as opposed to forcing those fish to try to bite when they're feeding on such a small forage. Now, in addition to Chickamauga, let me just throw a little pin here, and uh, I'm going to roll my home lakes, just to kind of give you a different perspective. If we come over to where I fish, which is over in the Ozarks, and we go over to, exam for example, like a uh, Grand Lake... On Grand Lake, you have a lot of rocky shorelines and a lot of rocky areas. And whenever you get, uh, let me try to find a good example here. One here. So we have a lot of rocky banks. And whenever you have a lot of like chunk rock banks and bluff walls and stuff like that, there's usually going to be a population of crawfish that's going to be living on these rocky points, these rocky banks. And there also are going to be some shad. Well, if I get into areas where there are just a million little tiny shad in, let's say, off this point, I'm going to roll out of this area, and I might run way back in the back of this creek to try to get away from all those shad. And there might not be nearly as many shad in this area of the lake, but as I roll over to this stuff over here, I might find that even though there's not a lot of shad in here, there might be some bigger crawfish that are setting up on like this rocky point, for example, and I can catch those fish that are feeding on those crawfish. I can throw a crankbait and a jig, and I might. there might be 50 to 100 fish down this bank, and I have to try to trick five of them into biting, which is a lot trickier sometimes than fishing down a bank that might have 1,000 fish, which this area might have like 1,000 fish in it. But, again, 1,000 uncatchable fish because the forage is too small are not going to do me any good. I'd much rather fish down a bank that has 50 to 100 catchable fish. That's something you really pay attention to. It's the catchable fish versus the fish that are plentiful. There's a lot of fish, but they're not actively feeding. A lot of this stuff, this content, guys, I talk about in a lot of the seminars, so I'm not going to dive into all the aspects there. That's what um, I try to say some of that stuff for the, the premium content, the seminars and things, but I do want to give you guys that general idea. There's a lot more detail that I go into into my seminars, especially with the offshore fishing seminars, as well as um, just the electronic stuff. I get a lot into forage and how forage affects bass, all these different factors that nobody on the professional tour really talks about. They might hint at it, but a lot of these guys know a lot more than you think they do. The best guys in the world, they know stuff that would shock you, that they don't talk about. 
just like that little frog with the weights in the frog, that's just a little tiny trick that guys throw out there. And maybe, you know, not that many guys know about it, but a lot of guys do. There's stuff that these guys know, know there do know though that is so crucial that guys just do not talk about. So um, that is that right there. So kind of that's the wrap up for the tournament. There's a lot of other stuff going on, guys. I know there was guys catching fish in a bunch of different ways. I don't want to go into every single pattern, and I don't know where every single area is, and I don't want to pretend to be an expert, but I did want to at least give you my two cents on, one, how tough the fishing was, how these guys were who were successful were able to maintain their weights, and just give you a general overview of the tournament. So the big key takeaways I would take from this event is, one, when you're fishing in the fall, expect the fishing to be very tough, regardless of how amazing your fishery is. Number two, Focusing on areas that are out of the way and out of pressure are very important. A lot of guys are going to be beating the banks in the fall, fishing the same pockets, the same coves, the same creeks. Therefore, getting into some really shallow flats or getting way up the river where no one is at or graphing some really subtle offshore areas that no one is fishing, those are the keys a lot of times to being a good tournament fall fisherman and being consistent in the fall. And the third thing is trying to determine where you can find areas that have actively feeding fish based on what forage is available. Find those fish that are feeding on crawfish or bluegill if the shad are too small, or find the bigger shad. Those are the keys that you can take away from this tournament, and that's pretty much um, the deal on all of these fall fishing tournaments. One other thing, too, is if you just look at a lot of these tournaments, a lot of you guys are catching fish up the river arms in the fall. Randy talks about that a lot, but running up the river arms is key in the fall, fishing shallow water. The guys that were down the lake, they were struggling, and they were having to go a lot more finesse tactics to get bit. So if you are fishing in the fall and you're struggling, running up the river is always a good option. And I'm talking way up the river, kind of like where Mike Huff was. You might have to make quite, kind of a long run, but that can pay big dividends in the fall. Wish I ran here to kind of expand on that because I'm not, that's not my style of fishing. I would honestly be more down the lake fishing um, these areas, kind of like what Sets and Blaylock was doing the first three days. That kind of resonated with me. And he was, you know, in second place after three days and he just wasn't able to kind of figure it out the last day. But his style of fishing was much more similar to what I would have been doing in the tournament offshore and maybe some of those, you know, schooling fish on bait. That's my deal that I do a lot in the fall. But anyway, so got some time here, guys. I uh, got 247 people on, which is awesome. And I just want to take a few questions from you guys. I have about 10, 15 more minutes here before I have to sign off. So any questions you guys have about fall fishing or about anything, feel free to ask over in the chat on the live stream. And while you do that, I'm just going to roll through a couple more things on fishmoment.com again while you guys answer or put in your questions. So I'm just going to take just two minutes to do this. Um, so just to give you guys time to put some questions in. Just a reminder that we have the lake breakdowns coming soon to fishmoment.com. Those will be launching on Friday, this Friday, October 23rd, and they're going to have GPS coordinates. So you can actually download GPS coordinates straight to your fish finder, which is really, really cool. Also have some upcoming virtual seminars. Um, the offshore seminar is booked up, but definitely sign up for the jerkbait seminar with Randy and the electronic seminar with myself for November if you're interested. These are filling up quick. This only has 15 spots left or 16 spots left for the electronics class and 20 spots left for the jerkbait seminar. So definitely sign up if you're interested. And also reminder to sign up for virtual seminars or virtual lessons with Randy, one-on-one -on -one lessons. I've been offering them myself for a long time, but Randy is just going to start throwing his hat in the ring with these. And so if you want to get some tournament prep going or just get prepped for the next year of tournament fishing or just understanding the mental side of fishing, anything like that, Randy is an amazing resource for that. And he has times available uh, pretty much throughout the rest of the year, except for when he's fishing out of the open. So let's jump back over now and talk about or answer some of these questions you guys are asking. Pull us over here. There we go. Okay. So um, Matt says, going to Grand this weekend, more info, LOL. Uh, when I was on Grand last week, last week, I was catching them on a football jig in 15 to 20 foot of water on Main Lake Points, which is interesting. And then Randy was catching them around the sailboat bridge area, um, fishing a spinnerbait around isolated wood. So that's that's what we were doing. Uh, hopefully that helps. Let's see here. 
Uh, what patterns to run in a nuclear plant lake? Usually on nuclear plant lakes, um, there's going to be big groups of fish that stack up. One of the lakes that I fish a lot is, um, people probably don't want me talking about this, but I don't care, uh, is Lake Swepco, and it's over here in Arkansas, and it's a power plant lake. You've seen me film a couple of videos out there, and for whatever reason, it seems like on these power plant lakes, there's going to be like a section of the lake where the water gets let out. This is where it gets let out here on Swepco. And there's always going to be a group of fish that live right here where the water's let out. There's always going to be a group of fish down towards the dam base or the area furthest away from where the water is let out. These are where a lot of your fish group up. But what I like to do a lot of times is find those areas that are kind of in the in-between zones. And you can catch a lot of fish in these areas because they don't get as much pressure as right by the discharge and right by the dammed up sections. And as you get later in the year, you know, your standard techniques are going to work really well. Your spinner baits, crank baits, down the bank. But one thing I will say is if you can find the forage, find where the majority of your bait fish are, except for down by the dam or down where the water's let out. If you can find another creek that has a good amount of bait fish in it, usually you're going to be in good shape. A lot of times a lot of the bait though is going to congregate in these couple areas. So finding the bait fish away from the obvious stuff, that's the key on those power plant lakes. Let's see here. When is the best time to fish offshore season-wise, uh, Francisco? Um, I would say... May, June, July, like post-spawn, right after the fish get done spawning and they start pulling offshore, or then in the middle of the winter, like uh, January, February, if you're on a clear water lake. If you're on a dirty water lake, offshore fishing is not great in the winter. Shallow water fishing is actually better. I catch fish year-round offshore. Fall fishing is not great offshore, but it's also not great up shallow, so it's kind of a crapshoot. And, you know, really the best time to fish offshore is right after the fish spawn, just like the best time to fish up shallow is during the spawn or right around that time. Let's see here. Uh, Roger Allen says, I am on Clear Lake. Can you do virtual lessons for Clear Lake? Definitely can do Clear Lake. We can do lakes all across the country. Um, I've basically given lessons on almost every single lake, it feels like, across the country. And I do a lot of prior research. Randy will as well spend about you know 30 minutes to 45 minutes digging into the lake. If we don't know it very well, we might spend like an hour trying to determine all the best areas, locations. So it's not like we're just jumping on the call and just like talking out of our butt. Like we're going to prepare, get, make sure that we know what's going on. We watch a lot of YouTube videos of the lakes, just getting dialed in. And, you know, I know Clear Lake pretty well just from all the videos I've watched on over the years. And I know a lot of little sneaky stuff out there just because I, I watch every single YouTube video, every single thing that comes on the internet, guys, about fishing. I'm just a fishing freak. So fishing, um, uh, like, obsessed dude. So I will watch every single YouTube video, all the Bassmaster footage, read every article. That's just the way I am. And I know a lot of stuff about a lot of lakes. Unfortunately, my brain is good enough that I can remember a lot of it as well. I probably remember 80 to 90% of what I read and what I what I watch. So I'm able to help you guys out a lot through all of that. Anyways, uh, let's see here. How do you modify your bait keepers on your jigs? That is a great question. Let me pull up Tackle Warehouse here. So that's kind of a little trick. It's a little bit tricky to do that depending on the jig, but I will tell you at least what I do. Um, let me get this pulled up. So what I've always done, and it's not like the perfect method, but uh, for example, like one of my favorite jigs is a Jewel Pro Spider jig. Jewel Pro Spider jig, just a little you know, classic ball head jig. It doesn't have the best bait keeper on it though. And so what I've always done is I take this jig and I will pull the skirt back and I actually have a vise that I used to use for fly tying. And all I'll do is I will take a paper clip and I will cut it in half and I'll just kind of bend the paper clip to kind of create like a little um, L like a or like a J hook. And I will place it on the shank of this hook right here and then kind of up the um, actual bait keeper, the little piece of lead here. And what I'll do is I'll start out by taking some old braided fishing line and I will just wrap braided fishing line around there. I actually have a little fly tying tool. You can get all this stuff for fly tying like 
um, the vise and the little line keeper things. And I wrap the line around there and I'll put braid around there several times. And then once I do that, I'll super glue it. And then sometimes if that doesn't get the job done, I'll also put shrink wrap around there and heat up some shrink wrap on there. And I'll also put some more fishing line, tie some more braid with more super glue. Some jigs require more stuff than others, but it will save you a lot of trailers, especially if you're skipping jigs and stuff like that. So that works really well for me. There's other ways to do it. You can look it up on YouTube videos and stuff, but I've always just done the braided line super glue that works 90% of the time and shrink wrap if you need it. Uh, let's see here. When the water is dropping in shallow water, like lakes like Chick, why would you not, why would the fish not pull out of the grass? So what happens a lot of times is that the fish, they don't necessarily actually pull out of the grass. When the lake is falling, it actually makes the bite better because the forage, the food is not going to leave the grass. That's one thing that is big. Like those fish were in 10 inches to a foot and a half of water because the forage was still up there. And that's where all the habitat is. What happens though is that instead of setting up on these big expansive grass flats when the water's high, those fish will spread out everywhere. They'll get all over this grass. But when that water drops, instead of being all the way up here on this flat and all up on this stuff, the fish will pull out of these big flats and pull into these drains where you can see here, here's actual some water right here. And this is dry land. They'll pull into this little drain that's like maybe used to be two feet of water, but now it's 18 inches of water, or maybe even a foot of water where this drain is. And over here, you might be able to put your boat all the way up to here, for example, when the lake is a foot low, and normally this is maybe four foot of water, and now it's three, maybe two and a half foot. And you can pull your boat up to here, and the water up here where I have this Lee-Livesey marker, that might be six, 16 inches, 12 inches of water, and all this stuff could be almost be literally just grass at this point. It's like someone's front yard, just dry water. And all those fish will pull in this gut. And they might not stay there for a long, long time, but they might stay there for two, three, four days, five days. And as that water falls, it groups up those fish. And then after a while, they'll start funneling out a little bit. But in the fall, those fish love to be in like a foot to two to three foot of water. Like people fish way too deep when you're fishing in the fall. If you're gonna fall fish, honestly, like any time from September through December, you cannot fish shallow enough those times of the year. You can fish up in six inches to a foot of water from September through the middle of December, even when the water temperatures are 50, 48 to 50 degrees, those fish should be up in a foot of water. Trust me, it, it does work. Um, I don't really fish and do that that much. I used to a lot when I used to fish tournaments and when I was growing up. But now I'm so obsessed with offshore fishing, I don't really do that anymore. But Randy will be showing that in our videos coming up for sure. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Fisherman went uh, big bass bash on Table Rock a couple weekends from now. Any suggestions? Uh, table Rock. If you're fishing Table Rock, you want to be fishing for largemouth, obviously. So go back into the creeks. You want to be fishing the backs of the creeks, the very, very backs of the creeks on Table Rock, and fish where you have a little bit of stained water. That will help out get those bigger largemouth to bite. Or if you don't want to do that, you can also stay out in the very main lake section and throw a big glide bait. That's another good way to catch some really big fish in a couple of weeks here on Table Rock. Come down towards like, I like the Kimberling City Bridge area. Stick around this area, kind of in this area, and throw a big like, I mean, I'm talking a big glide bait. Let me pull up um, what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about, like, not the 155 depths. I'm talking about, I'm not, like, a glide bait guy, but I've, I have a few that I throw. Um, like, this is, I have some of these depths, 250s, I actually picked up when I was in a study abroad in China. I bought them for $30, and all my friends hate me because they're like 160 bucks, and they're like, give me one. But the one I throw is uh, this one right here. That's the glide bait I have, and it's the only color I have. It's just this flash carp, but I throw this 250. Like, it's, it's huge. I mean, it's 10 inches long, it's six ounces, I have a special rod for it, you throw that thing, and you might get one or two bites a day, and when you do, boom, it's a really big one, so that's one way to go about it, but yeah, they're um, they're sold out of these right now, 
So I'm glad I picked mine up in China. I have three of them, which is pretty cool. So um, another question here. Corey asked, does Randy's Jerkbait Seminar have any good applications for northern natural lakes? This, that would apply this time of year, 50 degree water temperatures in Wisconsin grass natural lakes. Uh, Corey, I would not recommend that seminar for the natural lakes up north this time of year. He talked about it a little bit in our last seminar, but it's not really a big player. I would recommend it more for guys who are down south um, on your traditional southern impoundments, you know, your Tennessee, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Alabama, North Carolina, those places. As you get up to like the Massachusetts, Minnesota, Wisconsin, things like that, not going to apply as much. It will work really well though on California. So if you guys are in California, all that stuff will help as well. But a lot of the information is tailored more towards the Southern anglers. Good question there. Um, Matthew asks, have you ever fished Texoma? The bite is killing me. I have not. I want to make a trip over there. It's not that far away from me, honestly, but um, I've heard the fishing's a little bit tough out there. Fish rocky points with the crankbaits. That's all I know. Um, let see here. One more question here from Bassman. Uh, I've seen shad of almost two pounds. I'm guessing um, to target the Kings River. Let's see here. Yeah, the Kings River does have some stuff in it, but I would say um, if you're talking about Table Rock, but yeah, there's some really big shad. I don't, I don't really understand the question, but um, let me take one more here. Um, David asked, going to Gunnersville next week seems like the same concepts apply. For sure. I would, David, if I, would, if I were you, I would watch any of the live coverage or any of the Bassmaster coverage that they have from the Gunnersville Elite Series event that was there a couple weeks ago. The bite shouldn't change too much from when they were there then, and you should be able to get a decent understanding of what the guys were doing, how they were fishing. Running up the rivers will definitely be a good idea. The fishing pressure on Gunnersville has just been unbelievable. So, um, yeah, trying to figure out what those guys are doing. Uh, Brandon Cobb did really well throwing a buzzbaiter on boat docks and on uh, isolated grass mats. There's some guys fishing offshore that did uh, pretty well, as well as guys way up the river. So there was a little bit of everything rolling, but I would definitely recommend watching that tournament. I would say the offshore bite's going to be worse than it was when they were there, and the shallow water bite is going to be better. That's what I would say. So anyways, um, that is all I have time for, guys, 8.05. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the stream. I'm just running solo today. Um, you know, Randy will be here. He won't actually be here next week. I'll be doing another solo live stream next week, and so I'll figure out a topic for that, and we'll be talking again, just me and you, it's the camera, next week. And then once Randy's back from his open swing uh, over on the East Coast, then he'll be back here and we'll be doing a lot more live streams, more videos, all kinds of stuff. We will be putting, putting those lake breakdowns on fishmoment.com on Friday with the GPS coordinates, so check those out. And I am going to be working on that the rest of the week. I'm going to try to post a couple of YouTube videos, but um, being a kind of one man operation plus my wife, I have to basically rely on her and myself to get all of the changes done on all the website stuff. So we're not as agile as we sh we want to be with the website and stuff, but um, we hopefully these changes are going to be very helpful and help you guys get a lot more value out of our products. That's really the goal. And I'm revamping a lot of other things that we're doing just to get prepared for November so we can hit the ground running and put a lot of good content out. Sorry than that, guys. Really appreciate it. I am going to be posting a lot of these live streams to the Fish Moment Podcast. If you go to the Apple iTunes app or on Spotify, you can find the Fish Moment Podcast just by searching it. And I'm going to be uploading in this next week, week and a half, part of my overall project to get caught up on stuff that I've been neglecting for six months. Um, I'm going to have like 25, 20 or 25 additional podcasts I'm putting up of old live streams and YouTube videos that I feel like would be good just to listen to on the road going to the lake. So if you guys want some really good fishing content, there's going to be a lot of content on Fishing Moment Podcast. So check that out. And other than that, thanks for checking out the live stream and I'll see you guys next week.